Welcome to The Big Rich Show. This podcast will focus on conversations with friends and acquaintances within the four-wheel drive industry. Many of the people that I will be interviewing, you may know the name, you may know some of the history, but let's get in depth with these people and find out what truly makes them a four-wheel drive enthusiast. So now's the time to sit back, grab a cold one, and enjoy our conversation. Whether you're crawling the Red Rocks of Moab or hauling your toys to the trail, Maxxis has the tires you can trust for performance and durability. Four wheels or two, Maxxis tires are the choice of champions because they know that whether for work or play, for fun or competition, Maxxis tires deliver. Choose Maxxis. Dread victoriously. Why should you read Four Low Magazine? Because Four Low Magazine is about your lifestyle, the four-wheel drive adventure lifestyle that we all enjoy. Rock crawling, trail riding, event coverage, vehicle builds, and do-it-yourself tech all in a beautifully presented package. You won't find Four Low on the newsstand rack, so subscribe today and have it delivered to you. On today's conversation with Big Rich, we have Don Alexander. Don Alexander has a long history in off-road. We're going to talk all about that. We're also going to talk about his essay publications, the CarTech performance modifications of the YJ, JK, and JL, which will be out in October this year. So, Don, thank you very much for coming on board. And uh, I know we're going to have a good conversation about your long history in off-road. Well, thank you, Rich. It's a it's a pleasure to be with you and speak with you. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. And yeah, I have a long history. Um, part of it's off road. Part of it, I actually started racing go karts when I was a kid. Okay. And had a 50 year plus racing career before wow. I really got into off roading. Okay. Well, great. Let's let's talk all about that. In fact, let's get started at the very beginning. Where okay. were you born and raised? I was at Southern California. I uh, grew up in the San Gabriel Valley. That was a uh, mecca for hot rodding, 50s and 60s. Uh, so I was, I got caught up as a kid in that that whole thing. Uh, in addition to sports, um, I was a decent baseball player. But there was a um, a local TV show, probably in the mid to late 50s, called Jalopy Derby. Okay. And it was at the old Ascot dirt track, and they were, you know, old. 30s and 40s, basically hot rods that raced on a dirt track. And it was televised, uh, like on Friday nights. And that is really what kind of got me hooked in the whole thing, plus growing up in the hot rod culture of Southern California. And uh, things kind of progressed from there. So you said 50 years of racing. Yes. And you grew up in San Gabriel Valley. So you you raced in Southern California primarily, I would say. And then... yeah. The uh, so let's talk about let's talk about those early years, maybe even before the racing, unless it started real young. Well, I was eleven. Eleven, so I was okay. pretty young. Yeah. yeah, I started racing go karts. Uh, I grew up about three miles from actually a couple of iconic facilities: the old San Gabriel Valley Drag Strip. Uh, I could walk to that track as a kid from my home. Wow! And then a couple of miles further away was where. A guy named Duffy Livingston created the the uh, go kart, the original one, and uh, he had a factory and a little racetrack in Irwindale. If you're familiar with the area, it was right across the street from where the Miller Brewing Company is now, okay. uh, right off the 210 freeway. But where the Miller Brewing Company was was where the old Irwindale drag strip was, which was built when I was in high school, and that's where I started drag racing. But I started racing go karts at the go kart track. Uh, when I was 11 years old and did that for a while when I was old enough to start drag racing. Uh, I would bracket race at, uh, by then San Gabriel was closed, but Irwindale opened, I think in 1965. I was there for, I don't know, maybe eight or 10 years. Uh, so I pretty much every Saturday night I'd be there bracket racing uh, or at least watching. So that was my neighborhood. That's where I grew up and uh, started started a racing career doing that. It's great that you were so close to all that action. I'm, I'm sure that 
really helped um, spike your interest. Oh, yeah. And in Southern California at the time, you know, we had like six drag strips within an hour of where I grew up. So you could go to different tracks with, with no problem. There was Lions in Long Beach, San Fernando, Fontana, uh, Pomona at the Pomona Fairgrounds, which is still in operation. Uh, so that, that really led me down the path of, uh, of racing. And then um, I did that through high school and early in college. And then when I was in college, you know, watching TV, watching the Indy 500. Back in the day, we would go to a, a theater to watch the Indy 500. It wasn't televised. So you you bought a ticket and went into a a theater or some kind of a theater and watched the Indy 500. Wow. So I I got hooked on that that type of of racing. Uh, So you had to be 21 at the time to get an SCCA racing license. Okay. But when I was 19, I actually went to a, a racing school at Willow Springs, a Jim Russell racing school. Went through that, got into trouble because I was always pushing the RPM limit past what I was supposed to. <laughs> um, but I guess that was my nature and kind of led to uh, a mentality and just the way I, I ended up racing. Uh, and that started a career that, that lasted up till about, uh, I think my last official race was uh, in 2008. Wow. And then... By that time, I was starting to get into off-roading, and that kind of uh, took over at that point. But I raced all kinds of stuff. I raced uh, from drag racing. I, I got a SCCA license and raced in SCCA for years, then IMSA, the International Motorsports Association. And then towards the end of my career uh, with NASA, the National Autosport Association, won uh, quite a few races over the, over the years and a few championships. Um Probably um, in the course of that, I did some short track stock car racing, a little bit on dirt, mostly on asphalt. Was a journalist. Just did all kinds of stuff. But it was almost almost all car related. I had a few episodes, a few years where I did other stuff. Uh, I raced catamarans for a while, and I was a bicycle magazine editor, oh, thrown wow. in the mix of all the of all the uh, car stuff that I did, and which led to some interesting things too. But. So so let's let's talk about the racing of IMSA because that's something I'm familiar with. Um, I used to go out to in Monterey there and oh yeah Laguna Seca and, yeah Laguna Seca and photograph the Grand Prix racing there um, with the motorcycles and then the IMSA races, um, especially when um, Paul Newman Newman Freeman Racing was real strong down there with Nissan. Oh yeah. So what what class of cars did you race at that point i started out and they had a class called international sedan uh i raced in that and then they had a, a, a class called racing stock rs uh and that was actually my first experience with him so later uh, i co-drove with a friend in the gt series oh nice we actually had a, yeah it was fun we, we didn't have a competitive car uh although the car was pretty historic uh, this was in the mid 70s and in the late 60s this car was raced by Penske and driven by Don- Mark Donahue oh. in the Trans Am series so it was a really cool car um, but 10 years out it was just not competitive with the BMWs and Porsches that were racing in the IMSA at the time uh, funny story about that car my co-driver who owned the car uh, ran it at a club race at Riverside an SCCA club race and had a, a fairly minor crash and tore up the front sheet metal. And he went to a Chevy dealer to get a replacement fender and hood set and nothing fit because everything had been reduced in size by about 10%, <laughs> which was Penske was one of those people that was, was known for doing that. Same kind of thing that Smokey Eunuch would do. Right. If you're not cheating, you're not racing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're, you're certainly not winning. <laughs> True. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was that was a pretty interesting experience. But uh, I raced mostly production cars, but also raced some open wheel cars, formula cars. Uh, Laguna, uh, then I, back to IMSA, I raced in the Firehawk series as well. And drove a fairly competitive Camaro, uh, but we raced the year that the 944 Porsches were totally dominant, so it was almost like we were in a different class because okay. the top six or seven spots would all be Porsches, 
and then the Camaros and Firebirds and Mustangs will be ra basically racing for sixth or seventh or eighth place. But uh, yeah, I love Laguna Seca. I raced there a few times. That was it. The corkscrew is just an iconic corner that was just great challenge. Yeah, I I love the corkscrew. I liked. I used to love to sit at the bottom of that on the outside of that corner. And, oh yeah, uh, with a long lens and shoot. And one of the craziest photographs, and I still wish I had all that stuff, but I lost it all in a house flood. That we had, it was the sidecar racing, and the guy is hanging on the what you would call a sidecar right. and they're, they're coming down through there. And I mean, he's doing everything he can to keep that bike planted. And so he's, you know, just inches off the pavement and they're just flying. And this guy, he, all of a sudden they, they got a wobble. The bike comes way up the platform that he's leaning on, you know, hanging on. And then the driver corrected, brought it back down and just, pummeled the rider the the trapeze guy onto the pavement and i mean i don't even think he he slid or anything it was just like taking a pancake and flipping it over and smacking it down on a hot griddle because he just hit the ground and that was it it was that was some pretty gnarly spots in that corkscrew oh yeah and sidecars uh i never raced motorcycles i rode but never raced and a lot of people say I'm crazy, and one of the things I can do is point at sidecar side hacks. <laughs> say, no, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that is absolutely crazy. <laughs> You're putting your life in somebody else's hands, and you better trust them with everything you have. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, that that's a, that's a step beyond. <laughs> so then, um, in that in those years that the Porsche were dominating. Was it just the cars were that much better or were they were they just should have been in a different class by themselves? They really should have been in a different class. Um, or the, the rules should have been modified to allow bigger engines or something because they had way more power than the Camaros and other muscle cars did. Uh, and they were pretty well funded teams, which always helps. Yeah. That's true. But they just, they had a rules advantage that lasted for a season and, and uh, then it got equalized again. And ironically, uh, the car that I was racing, I did a series of books for Motorbooks International. And the first one was called Performance Handling. And that came out, this was in the 80s. I wrote the book and, and provided all the photography except for the cover shot. So when they sent me a proof of, of the cover in the book, the photo on the front, it wasn't me driving, but the photo on the cover was a Camaro that I raced. <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> it was a different driver. It was actually the year before I had driven it, but uh, that was a big surprise. And I just started laughing when I saw that because it was so ironic. Yeah. I mean, what's the chance of that? I mean, they could have used so many different vehicles or pictures. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that was one of, um, well, actually now I'm I'm working on, I think my 22nd or 23rd book. So that's been a big part of my career. And, and all but a couple of those were uh, car and racing related. So how did you, how did you come about getting into the publishing end of books like that? Did you take your college courses to help with that or, you know, no, what, no. What was your college courses? Uh, I was in mechanical engineering. Okay. And I, uh, you know, from high school, um, I did pretty good in high school, like a 3.2 GPA. Okay. Went to Cal Poly in Pomona in their mechanical engineering program. And my first semester at mechanical engineering, I really enjoyed that. And I was pretty decent at math. I had a math teacher who, um, for some reason, we just didn't hit it off. <laughs> and I ended up getting a D in that class. Oh. And I went and challenged him because I had... Uh, I, I got the the final test, and I had 19 out of 20 answers correct, and I got a got a D. And basically, the, when I went and met with the professor, he told me not to take his classes, so that put me a year behind in uh, the mechanical engineering program. Uh, it turned out the textbook that he was using was the same one I had in high school as, as a senior in high school, <laughs> and so. He took points off because I didn't get the answers his way. 
I got them the way I learned in high school. And it was crazy to me to think, should I? why should I change how I learned to do this just because this professor thinks it's better, even though I get the right answers? So I didn't get a degree, and that was a big part of why. And I, I went to work and started uh, at that point, you know, I was 19 or 20, uh, started building my first SCCA car and went racing and just had a, a series of different jobs. Um, and I actually... Um, in 19, 1970, I, uh, Bob Bondurant had moved from Orange County International Raceway with his driving school uh, to Ontario Motor Speedway right after it opened. And I went to work for him uh, pretty much as a rookie, but I learned to be an instructor, uh, had some great people to work with there. And that led to my career as an instructor. Uh, I ended up going to work after that for a school at Riverside Raceway. Uh, which wasn't real busy, so we got a lot of track time, which was really fun and very valuable. And a really funny story, a guy from L.A. County was, had a meeting set up with Bondurant at Ontario and got the tracks confused and ended up walking into the office at Riverside International Raceway. <laughs> uh, Les Richter, who owned the track at the time and was the president, overheard the conversation. This guy was looking for the Bondurant school. So Les walked out, introduced himself to the guy and said, oh, would you excuse me for a minute? Went back into his office, called us at the racing school and said, hey, can you guys teach ambulance drivers? Because <laughs> <laughs> L.A. County was looking at, at doing a defensive driving training program for ambulance drivers. And this was before paramedics were common. So ambulance drivers were wannabe race drivers. So we ended up getting the deal to train the county drivers uh, in L.A. County. So did that for a while. The school wasn't doing well, closed down. So I started my own school at the uh, Irwindale Drag Strip, close to where I lived. Did that for, for a couple of years until the gas crisis hit, and the county rescinded the requirement for our ambulance drivers to be trained. So naturally, none of the ambulance companies wanted to spend the money. But that was a great gig, and that's actually what kind of started my riding career because I wrote a training manual for the ambulance drivers. Turned out pretty good, and one thing led to another. So those two careers kind of started – off in the same direction, all because I was uh, involved in racing. And because you had a an instructor in college that was kind of a jackwad. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah, I, I, have, a, but, I have a very similar story. Um, I had an art teacher at a JC. I was trying to pick up my AA credits because before I went to photography school in Santa Barbara. So I was, I took a art appreciation class and thinking, okay, this will be an easy, you know, credits. How hard can it be? Well, the guy started off saying photography was not an art form. It was a commercial form and there was no true art in photography. And Ooh. we, we clashed every time we had an assignment, I would write, I, you know, I'd write about something in, you know, go to San Francisco, um, Museum of Fine Art, which, you know, had always had photography displays. And so I'd write <laughs> on the photography displays and then he'd give me an F or a D, you know, I mean, it was just same thing. So I had to take yeah. a, oh, yeah. I had to take a massage class once I got to Santa Barbara to fulfill a re elective, <laughs> but I didn't become a masseuse. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was probably a good thing. Yes. So at the, at the time it was, it was kind of devastating that that happened, but you, know, you look back at it 50, 60 years later and go, oh, that guy actually did me a big favor because yes. it set me off on a totally different path than I probably would have gone down. And a much more interesting one, maybe not as financially rewarding, but no complaints. It all worked out. And my grandfather always said, you know, figure out how to make a living doing what you love. And, exactly. Uh, you know, he didn't mean how much money you make, but how you got to live your life. And that's why you're on – conversations is so that we can talk about that interesting life. And so you did how many, you said you did 26 publications? Uh, 20, I, I think I'm on the 22nd or 23rd book. 22nd uh, or 23rd. I'm, I'm, uh, the JL and JK book is finished and I'm just starting on an overlanding book, which is, that's where the whole conversation in itself, the, the whole overlanding thing, which maybe later we can talk a little bit about. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but I'm also self-publishing three or four shorter books uh, that we're using for the the off-road school, the uh, Trails 411 school, and that's um, 
a lot of material that I've already created, but we're packaging it mostly to have to hand out to students when we do classes for them. Okay. So, but I've also done, God, hundreds and hundreds of magazine articles and I was the editor of, of several magazines over the years. Uh, and actually, I, <laughs> typical of, of how I've done things in my life, I started in the magazine business publishing my own magazine. Uh, it was a racing magazine. I was racing Formula Fords at the time and got talking to, to some of the local uh, shops that were selling and, and building Formula Fords. And he said, you know, we need a publication. So I kind of put a newsletter together and it grew from there. And uh, Within a, uh, six months or so, one of the companies asked if they could buy it from me. And I was kind of in over my head and it was way more work and money than I anticipated. So I sold it to them and it actually... Uh, they hired a guy, a, a young guy who had actually helped, was helping me as an art director, 19-year-old, very skilled, a uh, guy named Paul Fanner. And he stayed in the, in the publishing business and did some racing. But he's now and has been for the last 25 or 30 years the creator of, of Racer Magazine and their whole off, uh, online network. So he, was, he turned out to be extremely successful. He had a long road to get there, but... It was kind of interesting to give him a start with this little newsletter magazine that we put together. Uh, and then that just kind of led into to other things and uh, went to work for uh, my first magazine editor job was in the early 80s. It was actually right after Christy and I got married. I was doing a lot of freelancing. We went to Yellowstone and Bryce and Zion for our honeymoon driving her Pinto that had been her showroom stock race car, which is how we met through racing. <laughs> and funny story, uh, she had it service. We lived in South Pasadena at the time. She had it serviced at the local mobile station, which we'd been going to for years. And um, she had the oil changed and had all the, the trans, lube, trans gear lube and everything checked and brakes and everything. So we take off on our honeymoon and we get to Jackson, Wyoming, and it starts making noise <clears throat> the transmission was making noise and so we took it to a shop and they they uh, checked it and there was no trans fluid in the trans no gear loop oh wow uh, they forgot to refill it so we made it all the way from southern california to jackson wyoming with just the residual gear loop in the transmission <laughs> what brand <laughs> was it, being used <laughs> uh you know i boy that was a long time ago i don't remember but it was probably before synthetics so I was pretty pretty amazed that we made it that far. So we'd taken bikes with us. So at least we had transportation while the while the guy had to go 150 miles away to find a used Pinot transmission. <laughs> so we got it put in. We went to pick it up. We were, we were headed for Yellowstone, and we were going to stay at at um, by Old Faithful on the Old Faithful Inn, which was a beautiful place. It was a great trip. So we about four o'clock in the afternoon we go pick the car up to drive into into Yellowstone, and I get in to back it out of the guy's shop. And I made it about 10 feet, stopped out of the car and said, you put the throttle bearing in backwards. And he goes, oh, no way. So he gets in the car and tries it. And he just, you see his head drop and he's just saying, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, yeah, give me an hour and a half. There's a, there's a little bar and restaurant right around the corner. Go have dinner and I'll get this fixed for you, which he did. And we drove away and had, had no more problems the rest of the trip. But uh, it was a pretty funny way to start start our marriage so <laughs> you being able to tell it the the throat bearings in backwards and and then be right exactly you know with the guy that's awesome yeah well my dad was an auto mechanic and uh, one of one of the skills i learned was was being a decent wrench working for my my dad when i was a kid I did that all through high school and a little bit into college and then i moved on doing doing other jobs and um, I was never really a good enough mechanic to, or, or liked it enough to make a living at it. Uh, but certainly developing those skills was, was hugely helpful throughout my entire career. Absolutely. Especially as a racer, if you're, if you're racing and you can, and if you have crew and you can actually explain what the car is doing while you're on the track so that the mechanics, the crew can work on it and, maybe, you know, tune it, make adjustments, whatever. It's a lot better than saying, well, you know, it it just kind of rides weird or it's making a funny noise if you can help locate or pinpoint the, the problem. Oh, absolutely. It goes a long ways. 
Well, especially when it comes to handling and, and getting a car set up, uh, the driver is a critical part of that. And uh, not a lot of drivers are, are really good at that. Uh, and now with data acquisition and computers and everything, it's, it's much more uh, an engineering exercise than driver exercise. But, you know, back in the, in the 60s and 70s, um, that was a whole different ball game. I know the, the very first, uh, I built an Alfa Romeo as my first SCCA car and had virtually no budget to build the car. Uh, so we did some weird things and, and I knew being a, a newcomer to this, I had a very basic understanding of certain things that needed to be done. So I went and bought some bar stock because I knew we needed stiffer anti-roll bar sway bars. So I went and bought some bar stock and, and got a torch and bent them and put them on. And I had a big one in the front and three in the rear so I could adjust the handling balance. And actually got that car handling really well. And it was uh, with a stock engine, it was actually fairly competitive. And uh, that's what I got my SCCA license in and raced for a couple of years. And then uh, at that point, I actually started most often driving for other people. But uh, you know, those experiences were, were priceless in, in the overall scheme of things. And I ended up writing three handling books for uh, Motorbooks International, uh, all of which did fairly well. And that led to all kinds of stuff, including doing seminars and, and uh, instructing, uh, consulting for, for teams and individuals, helping them get their cars set up. And most of the time, when somebody would ask me to help them set up the car, it was more teaching them how to drive the car better than having a, a setup issue. They would complain that the car is doing something and it would turn out that they weren't really going fast enough for the car to have that handling problem. Hmm. So that made a that was a real challenge, uh, trying to be politically correct, which I'm not very good at. <laughs> <laughs> Saying, well, gee, I'm really sorry, but uh, it's not the car. It's it's actually some things we can work on with your driving. <laughs> with whether it's off-road or pavement or dirt, you still have to be able to handle the car to get the car to perform to its utmost. You know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I had a guy one time uh, sent him out to do some preliminary laps just to take some tire temperatures and see how the car was working. And and he came in and it was a uh, just a warm day. And this was up at Willow Springs, uh, but not super hot. And typically you'd see tire temperatures in the 160 to 220 degree range. And he came in with tire temperatures around 100 degrees, which was just a little bit hotter than the track temperature at the time. And you're not going fast enough to have a handling problem with those kind of tire temperatures. So that's when you really have to start getting them up to speed before you can even figure out what's going on with the car. So and I love those kinds of challenges. That was just great fun and, and uh, 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 such a joy to, to really connect with people and get them to improve, whether it was a the car they're driving or both. It's just a, a real pleasure to see people see that light bulb come on that people got it and right. they've improved it and they're they're just thrilled to death. Um, yeah, that's a that's a great thing. So we before we started recording, we were talking about um, Bob Bauer and you said right. that you had you had a relationship with him and talk about that a little bit. Sure. Well, there was a. Um, in the middle of all of this was it this was in the mid 90s um there well the, the first thing that happened i was the editor of circle track magazine and we got invited up to mason marin Sp uh, raceway up in bakersfield for a kind of a secret launch of what became the, the nascar trucks uh, the guy had a shop there. His dad owned the track, and he had a shop there. He raced in the Winston West Series, which was like the West Coast version of the, the Cup cars. Um, and he built this truck for four off-road racers, John Nelson, uh, Scoop Vessels, uh, and a couple of other guys. And uh, they got a hold of me at, Super, at uh, Circle Track and said, hey, can you come up and do an article on this? Well, yeah, of course. So we went up and had a, had a sneak preview of what became the Craftsman Truck Series. And uh, I was just really taken with that. And that led to um, getting involved in that series a little bit. And we actually uh, built a truck. 
I had a friend who pitched Craftsman for sponsorship for our truck. Well, they loved the, the whole idea so much, they ended up sponsoring the series, but not our truck. So we <laughs> built the truck and never really got to race it because by then it just got so ungodly expensive. Uh, we just didn't have a budget for it. But um, got to drive the truck a couple times. Well, that uh, the success of that series led to a short track series called Spec Truck. And that was created by a guy named John Nelson, who was an off-road racer and very connected with BFG. Uh, so I ended up with one of those trucks. Uh, I did a whole PR campaign for Spec Truck, got some some great publicity through the magazines, and then uh, started doing training for some of the drivers because a lot of them were coming from off-road racing. Uh, a couple of guys came from road racing and didn't have any oval track experience. So we go down to El Cajon or Lake Havasu to the short tracks there and do classes for these people. And um, one of the students was Bob Bauer. Uh, again, that was a, a publicity thing, but John's connection with BFG, he invited to come out, he invited Bob to come out. And um, that's how I met Bob. Excellent. John Nelson has a, a storied past as well. You know, he designed oh, yeah. him and uh, Bondurant, John Bondurant, designed tiny which was you know truly the first of many of course um now standard moon buggies we'll call it you know rear engine totally built functional rock crawler not done not designed for anything else and right, okay uh, it was pretty it was pretty cool um you know that everybody intertwines in this business yeah it's incredible you know relationships that i developed from from stock car racing when i was at circle track have translated into incredible, not just re relationships, but, but real friendships, uh, the Curry family being among them. Uh, I knew Frank way back uh, when I, back in the, in the 80s when I was, uh, or into the 90s when I was at Circle Track and even before that doing some old track racing. Right. And that's translated into John and Ray becoming really close friends. That's that's awesome. I did an interview with John as well. Um, Ray's on my list to do as well. So, you know, I'm looking forward to that. It, it's just great how how we're how this industry is intertwined. So let's let's go to to the fact that you went and and was you know doing the the training after the training while you were doing books and racing. How did how did off road become part of your life? Uh, moving to Big Bear actually was was what triggered that because we uh, we started exploring some of the as you know we have an extensive trail system in our backyard here right 600 miles of trails some world class uh, street legal rock crawling trails uh, which you've experienced a little bit of mostly mostly what we did was down in, in uh, Cougar Buttes in Johnson Valley but we have some great trails up here so that's really what started it was just some casual exploring um, my first real major off-road experience was actually at Bonneville. Um, in the course of, of you know, doing suspension design and, and consulting for companies, uh, an old friend of mine, um, an ex-Chevy engineer who was just brilliant, a guy named Paul Van Valkenburg, he wrote a, a book called Race Car Engineering, uh, which was iconic. Uh, super intelligent. He's a rocket scientist level guy. Um, and Gail Banks from Gail Banks Engineering contacted Paul to design a suspension system for a pickup truck he was building to take to Bonneville. Well, Paul was too busy, so he said he told Gail to contact me, uh, which he did. So I went and met with Gail about designing a suspension for this Dakota pickup truck that was going to have a Cummins diesel built into it. Um, <laughs> we ended up using pretty simple stuff. We took a, a front clip and a rear clip from a, a NASCAR a stock car. And basically that's, we fabricated that into the, into the stock frame, put a roll cage in it and shoehorned this huge engine into a Dakota uh, extended cap, <clears throat> excuse me, pickup with a, a 5.9 liter Cummins diesel that was shockingly stock, had some head work and a um, variable geometry prototype turbocharger. Uh, in the course of, of talking to Gail, he found out about my racing background, uh, and I'd given him a copy of, a, of one of the handling books. 
And I think there was one thing in that book that, that he jumped on, and that was how much, when you're accelerating, how much wheel spin is optimum for maximum acceleration. It turns out it's about 3% wheel spin. So if the, if the engine is, is spinning 5,000 RPM, the tires would be spinning 3% more than that. So he looked at that and goes, this guy probably actually knows how to drive. So he said, uh, are you interested in driving a truck at Monoville? Well, that had been a, a dream since I was a kid, but I never pursued it. So I said, obviously, I said yes. So we went to Bonneville, and we missed the first year. Uh, and actually, Bonneville is going on. The, the, uh, the Nationals are going on right now. We missed the Nationals the first year and the second year and made it to the World Finals in October of 2001 never been there so i had to go through licensing and they waived a couple of the runs because of my racing experience so the first time i sat in the in the truck because they finished it and towed it to bonneville and i met them there the plan was to tow a a small trailer behind the truck the race truck because it was street legal uh to bonneville well they couldn't quite do that so gail got in it they hooked up the small trailer to the to the it was called the sidewinder and towed it from the border to Bonneville behind the Sidewinder, uh, which got a, a lot of interest. Um, I had not been in the truck yet. I hadn't even sat in it uh, other than a seat fitting. So I had to, you have to do a bailout and tech, ins- tech inspection. So the first time I'm really in the truck, I'm strapped in to do this bailout and it's up on jack stand. So the, there were a couple of crew guys there that kind of caught me as I got out of the truck because it was two feet off the ground. And then <clears throat> had to do a 175 mile an hour pass and a 200 mile an hour pass to get my license. And um, we went 177 on the first run and 198 on the second run and ran out of injectors. They forgot to bring the fuel inject the bigger fuel injectors, so somebody flew them over from from Southern California. Uh, they put them in. We went out and did our first record run uh, that morning and ended up. I think our uh, Top speed on that run was 217 miles an hour. Wow. So, and we uh, backed that up and we ended up setting seven records, breaking our own records. Uh, The national record, which we set at 212, was uh, 159 miles an hour. So we kind of blew that record away. And then we set some international records. Uh, The last run we did to back up up our, our national record was real early on a Sunday morning because they couldn't get everybody through Saturday. So it's actually the morning after the meet was finished and they had like three vehicles that needed to do backup runs. So we did our backup run. It was about eight o'clock in the morning in October. It was cold. It was probably in the forties, which is great for making horsepower. So as I'm getting in the truck, Banks came over and said, uh, if the EGTs get over 1,700 degrees, you might as well shut the engine off because it's going to blow up. <laughs> <laughs> so we're making this run, and it's making a ton of power. And at about the three-quarter mile mark through the first time marker, I'm looking at the, I'm watching the EGT gauge, and the RPM is is about, and we're only running 4,000 RPM redline. We're about 200 RPM higher than we'd been at that point. And I'm watching that EGT gauge, and it's bouncing around 1650, 1675, and I'm ready to shut it off. And all of a sudden, there's this huge bang. And we had a quick change so we could change the gearing. I was based on a Dana 70, so it's pretty beefy stuff. And so I, I was so ready to put the clutch in in case it was an engine problem. I got the clutch in, realized it wasn't the engine because it was still running, and coasted for a quarter mile. And we had a 208 mile an hour mile coasting for a quarter mile in a pickup truck. Wow. Uh, what had happened is it was making so much torque, it twisted the pinion gear off the shaft, spit it through the case and into the back of the truck, which was what made all the noise. <laughs> Just made a huge racket uh, and then left a nice trail of gear lube for uh, until I got it slowed down and stopped. But uh one of my best quotes ever, which I didn't actually make, but somebody did in a magazine article, was that the the Sidewinder, you know, being a pickup truck, had the aerodynamics of a Walmart store, <laughs> 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 which is about true. Uh, from 220 miles an hour, just lifting off the gas was like making a panic stop. 
uh, you didn't need a parachute. We had one. We had to have one. And I, I used it a couple of times, uh, which was an experience in itself because I'd never driven something with a parachute. But that whole experience was incredible. I'd, the one thing I would do um, at this point in my life racing-wise, I would go back to Bonneville on a heartbeat if I had a good ride. Nice. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. That was a that was a great people, great experience, um, and just uh, just everybody was so helpful. And um, it was like SCCA club racing back in the '60s and early '70s. Just great camaraderie and just a great group of people. But that later, I mean, that wasn't really off roading, but just the casual off roading in, in Big Bear. Um, and then um, bought a. Nissan Xterra off-road, and this was where I was working, uh, actually was working at, at uh, Banks for a while, for two or three years, and I was commuting every day from Big Bear down to to uh, Banks, but we had this really nice off-road vehicle, so I started doing more off-roading, met a guy who ran the off-road tour company here in Big Bear, and uh, we started shooting some videos for him, because uh, that was the other thing I got into around that time was video. Uh, we actually done a lot with uh, onboard video with with the racing towards the end of my racing career. Um, so started working with him, started learning the trails, starting doing doing more difficult trails, and that led into doing a local cable TV show, which was a whole new experience. Um, and actually had a lot of fun with that. And I had um, been invited to a, a fam trip. Um, a familiarization trip for Toyo Tires to Japan to go to their test track. Okay. And um, that's where I met Bill Bainbridge, who had, he was at Toyo Tires. And he had, he was the guy who actually was the marketing guy at BFG when the first uh, all terrain tire was created. The first purpose built back in the 70s, all terrain tire. Uh, so Bill had quite a background in, in off roading. Uh, so I went on this fan trip. Bill and I became close friends. We still are to this day. Uh, he's back in Pennsylvania. We actually uh, were back there a couple of years ago and, and had a chance to visit with him. But um, when we were doing this TV show, Bill had had moved uh, to Hong Kong Tire, uh, which was based back in, uh, I believe, in New Jersey. And um, I called him one day and said, hey, do you want us to do something on your on the Hong Kong off-road tires on the TV show? And he, was, he happened to be in uh, Korea at the time because Helen Cook's a Korean company. Uh, he was gone for about three or four weeks. And he got back, called me and said, uh, can we still do this? And I said, yeah. And a few days later, he called me and said, can you do a, a, a tire media launch for us? And I said, sure. We've done some media stuff in the past. That's not a problem. So he sent me the proposal from their PR company, which was – for 12 vehicles, all stock, all rented, uh, doing an off-road event up in Santa Barbara on Refugio Road, which is where the Reagan Western White House was located. Right. So that road, that's better than, than 90% of our paved roads, the way it's maintained. You know, it's like a, a dirt superhighway. Right. And I looked at this proposal, and they were they were charging an ungodly amount of money. And they were going to take people up to Santa Barbara and put them up at the Fest Parker Inn for in a $400 a night hotel and a $100 dinner. Uh, so you got the highway drive driving these vehicles up there. And then they were going to do Rufufio Road and come back to L.A. And I looked at I looked at that. I called Bill and said, is this thing for real? And, he, and I, I said, first of all, it's ungodly expensive. And he goes, oh, yeah. And I said, plus, this isn't going to showcase. You, you could do this in a Prius. Um on terrible tires and not learn anything. So this is not going to showcase the tires at all. He goes, yep. Um, can you get me a proposal in two days? <laughs> <laughs> Which I did. We ended up doing that event for them. Uh, it was a great tire. It was the, uh, the Han Cook uh, RF-10. Uh, they've got a newer version now, but that was a, a really good all-terrain tire. Uh, so after that, we did, um, uh, and I had an Xterra, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, so after that, we ended up, they wanted to put it in SEMA, so we ended up modifying it, lifting it a little bit, and putting a winch bumper, skid plates, and it turned out to be a really nice off-road vehicle. Not great on the on the more difficult Black Diamond trails up here, but for everything else, it was great. Uh, so we ended up putting that in SEMA. After that, we started doing, uh, 
we did a comparison tire test for them. And we ended up, um, when we did the media event, uh, a friend of mine who was a, a he had a little repair business for Land Rovers, a Brit, for Land Rovers and Jaguars. So we hooked up, started a business to do this under a corporate umbrella. And then um, he was into Land Rover. So we, we did, did this comparison testing using a Land Rover. And we had a crew. And rather than, than using multiple vehicles, we, we did about 20 different tests using the same vehicle. So every, you know, we could try to gang two or three tests together like a hill climb and hill descent. But we have a crew, and we we tested against three other tires. So we were doing four tire changes wow. every time we would change. So, and we did it. It was in March, so we still had some snow up here. So we did some snow testing. We went down to Johnson Valley and did a little section um, of jackhammer uh, in some areas around there and the sand, just basically all over. And it was a. It took us about two weeks to do this. Uh, and it, it was really a great experience and, and what a way to learn about tires and, and the differences in tires. Um, so then we did a, a media event, which was a comparison test. And that one we used three different vehicles because changing tires would have been crazy with the media. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's what really got me started. And then um, the last media event we did, uh, that's when I decided, you know, I'm not really. Uh, I had a bunch of friends that I, I could pay to use their Jeeps. And I said, we really need to be in the Jeep market. So that's when I bought my first Jeep. And that was in 2012. Uh, so that's when I really got into it. And my, f- it's funny how things work because uh, one of the things I did when I started this is I realized there weren't good maps of the local Big Bear area that showed the trails and the difficulty. So I created a map got great industry support and some local advertising and uh, ended up doing about 10 of these maps over the years. And uh, it was really a lot of fun. And my first advertiser was Ray Curry from Curry Enterprises. And we had been out shock testing for Coney because they had a really nice uh, Land Rover shock on John Bull. And um, we got to a section and and, the, the vehicle was capable, but just didn't have enough ground clearance. So, we got to the middle rock garden, which is the most difficult part of the trail. And we're having to stack some rocks to get over this one section. And here comes Ray Curry with a magazine guy and, and uh, uh, somebody else in a, in a second Jeep. So I went over and, and talked to Ray for a while. Uh, it turned out, I forget which magazine it was, because uh, there were several of them back in the day. Uh, and the, uh, he, he was an experienced off and He was getting car sick. <laughs> <laughs> which was really interesting. But what was funny about it is, you know, a couple of years later, I'm doing this map and I told Ray, well, if you've got a good cover shot, we'll put that on the cover of the first map because they were fold up maps. And he gave me this photo that was taken that day at that spot by the photographer that was car sick. <laughs> <laughs> so just another one of those funny coincidences. So uh, between doing the maps and, and um, developing even more relationships in the off-road industry, uh, I bought a Jeep, and my original plan was I'm going to put 35s on it and do a little lift and you know, I'd be able to do any trail up here. And one day I got a call from Ray and talk about opening the floodgates. I got a call from Ray Curry, and he said, uh, uh, we're going to come out with the um, the Rock Jog 44 aftermarket axles for the JKs, and we want you to, to test them for us. Well, okay. <laughs> so I got the axles, full axles, 488 gearing, air lockers, and, it, and it, this was when they were, it was all one company, and we put a rock jock suspension on it with anti-rock sway bars and all that, so uh, all of a sudden, I've gone from this mild 35-inch, 2-inch lift build to a 4-inch lift with all this cool stuff on it. We ended up with PSC power steering, and, you know, all the goodies, and, and uh, then I... <clears throat> That was then I started really getting into rock when we put 37 inch tires on it. We had the first Falcon off road tires, and then I'd done some stuff with Mickey Thompson. Um, so it just kind of snowballed. Uh, and then I got a call from uh Paul Joe, who you met, who had, had yep. worked at Helen Cook, that's where I met him. Okay, he's now at Nexon Tire, great guy. We, we become really close friends. Got a call from Paul saying, uh, can you do some comparison testing for for um. Uh, Nixon's all-terrain tires. So we started doing that. And what was when we used my Jeep, and what was really fun was going from a 37-inch tire 
and we did the same routine. We did about 24 different tests, and in, in, uh, I think we did it in six days. We went to a 33-inch all-terrain tire from 37-inch mud-terrain tires. So as a driver, that was a real challenge. It's like, wow, this is really fun. Um, and I, I love the big tires, but boy, when you go back down to a smaller tire, it really teaches you how to drive or reminds you you, you need to be a driver. Correct. So that was great fun, plus a, a great learning experience. Then we did the same thing with it when they came out with the, uh, the Rodian MTX mud train tires. Uh, and we're still doing, well, last year was horrible with the pandemic. We didn't do anything. But um, we'll be starting again probably later in the fall doing doing events for Nexon like the one you attended. Uh, so that all led to, to becoming... Uh, so involved in off-roading, uh, especially in the Jeep market, that there was no reason to do other stuff. And it's one example that was just hysterical. Um, my wife, because of, of the records at Bonneville, my wife is always saying, how can Mr. Speed Demon have fun rock crawling at three miles an hour? <laughs> so we did a um, an old friend of mine, Rick Titus, had done a, a radio talk show called driver's talk radio for years. And, um, I had been on the show a few times and, and, he, um, he just said, he said, let's come up and do something on, on your school. So they did. And one of the, uh, Steve Celine from the Celine Mustangs, and the Celine supercar, um, had, had actually bought the rights to the show and was funding it from his factory in, uh, Corona real close to where Curry is. Um, so one of the people that was on the show was Molly Celine, Steve's daughter, who was racing Lambert, racing what was a, similar to a Lamborghini uh, in the spec Celine S7 series. So she came up. She was driving my Jeep on John Bull. The night before at dinner, uh, my wife told the story about Mr. Speed Demon having fun at three miles an hour. And she thought, well, that was kind of weird. So we're on John Bull. She's driving. I'm riding shotgun. Rick is in the back seat, and we get up to a, a pretty rocky section where you have to climb up on rock and you get real tilty. And she got up a little higher than she should have, so it got even more tilty. And she just went into a, a total panic mode. And so I got her calmed down and off the rock. And she uh, and one of my favorite lines: "It's just a rock. I'll get over it." Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> So she stopped and you know, got her breathing under control. And I'm just kind of chuckling and said, yeah. She goes, now I know exactly what your wife was talking about. She said, I've never been so scared in a race car as I was doing that. <laughs> so that kind of sums up the three mile an hour adrenaline rush you can get. So, Absolutely. Uh, so that was, yeah, that was a, a pretty cool experience. So, um, so back after I built the JK, um, I guess, um, one of the editors from motor books on the handling books that I did, and I also did a, a driving book for them, a, a stock car driving techniques. And I'd done a, a previous to that, I'd done a driving book for Robert Bentley uh, in Massachusetts called Think to Win. Uh, so anyway, this guy um, got a hold of me, and he'd been an editor at, at motor books. He was now at SA Designs and got a hold of me and said, We want to do a Jeep JK book. Are you interested? Right? Yeah, sure. So that's how that whole relationship started. Uh, and after we did that, we were supposed to do a TJ book, but in the interim, they gave it to somebody else. So we got to do the YJ book. So we built the, the YJ that you saw down in Johnson Valley. Mm -hmm. Then uh, at SEMA, we talked about uh, the next project. So we decided to do a JL and Gladiator book. Uh, so I decided, well, this is an opportunity to, to build a JL. But it's got to be better than the JK or it's not worth doing. So now I've got a full built JL. We started with a Sport S because uh, all the stuff was going to come off of it that makes it a Rubicon except for the transfer case. So we ended up with, with Curry 60 Extreme axles and Rock Jock suspension and the Bilstein B8 8100 shocks and PSC power steering and JE real drive shafts and a bunch of other stuff that makes it a super vehicle. I've had it for 15 minutes and it's only got 5,000 miles on it. So, <laughs> but um, that we can do pretty extreme stuff. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, 
it's been um, a bit of a roller coaster ride, but a thrill and uh, just really satisfying. What do you see? You you know, are you going to continue the trying to put together the essay books for? Uh, is that who you're doing the overlanding for? Yeah, the overlanding book. Um, yeah, kind of a can of worms, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's honestly not something I'm well versed in, so it's a, a pretty steep learning curve, uh, which isn't surprising. But boy, it's such a huge market, and it's attracting a whole new level of participants. Yes, which in itself is really interesting and challenging. And there's some some interesting phenomenon um, that. I'm still not sure I have a, a good way to deal with it in a book, but um, a couple of examples. One is rooftop tents. They're immensely popular. There's, I think when I when I last looked, there's something like a hundred companies selling rooftop tents. And the downside to me is higher center of gravity and you know, just a lot of weight. But what I don't get, and this kind of leads to some of the other problems, what I don't get is you have a rooftop tent, you have it set up, now your vehicle is is not usable as a vehicle. Uh, you're kind of stuck unless you break camp. So if you want to camp someplace for more than a day or a night and you want to explore, you've got to pack everything up and then reset it up again the next night. So that's one of the things about rooftop tents I don't get. But the center of gravity to me is a, a bigger issue. Now, if you're doing mild trails, it's no big deal. <clears throat> but if you get into uh, more extreme trails or even moderately extreme trails, that's an issue. And we're getting some serious rutting because of a lack of maintenance and uh, a different market, just different types of vehicles and, and uh, different ways that people are driving. The other thing I'm concerned about with overlanding is it's attracting people, which is great, but they're not really dialed in to the outdoor environment and the ethics. There are very specific dispersed camping rules, and it changes from, from forest to forest or BLM land districts to between them. And um, BLM is probably a, a lot easier to deal with, but uh, in the forest, uh, especially on the West Coast, the rules are, are similar, but a little bit different. You can camp any place, but that doesn't mean you can drive any place. Right. Uh, and the rules basically say if it's undisturbed ground, you cannot drive or park there. Pretty simple. But we're seeing people constantly driving off of the, the designated routes into areas that have never been driven on. And now they've been driven on, so the next group that comes along may think, well, okay, that's been disturbed. I can go there. Uh, and the Forest Service is very aware of it. And it's, um, frankly, in, in here in the San Bernardino National Forest, I'm kind of surprised that they haven't closed the forest to disperse camping, at least for the next three or four months, because of the fire danger. Right. Because uh, I know that's definitely uh, uh, a consideration that they're making. Uh, UTVs... Um, Totally different set of problems. They can go much faster than, than a typical 4 by 4 especially a street legal. Uh, in our area, they're only allowed on certain uh, non-street legal trails, but they're basically going every place. And that <clears throat> is causing um, a very different set of circumstances on the road surfaces. So what we've seen happening, uh, and we saw this on the 25-hour event we did a couple months ago, is a um, different kind of damage to the road surface. You know, we've got out in the desert, you, you get the, the big loops that, you know, if you're in a, a street legal vehicle, you just go through fairly slowly and you're going up and down. And, but there's a rhythm to it and it's annoying, but not bad. And then um, a lot of places you get washboard. And if you've got decent suspension, you can go across washboard at 20 miles an hour and it's not a big deal. But now we're seeing something in between that. Um, it's it's more like big, more distance apart washboard sections 
that if you go over five or six miles an hour, it just kind of beats you to death. Right. And that's happening on a lot of trails. And it's really making it kind of miserable. And that's almost entirely from, from UTVs because you're, the frequencies are different. Uh, tires are smaller. And they're much lighter and they go much faster. So the, the frequency of the chop in the road has become very different. So we'll see what happens with those. But uh, with the overlanding, we're actually seeing more. And in our local area, we're seeing, which we've got some great camping spots for dispersed camping. We're seeing actually more overlanders than we are just you know, Jeeps and, and basic equipped four by fours. Uh, and most of them are Toyotas. Okay. So it's a, a significant change. Some of the concerns I have, we see a, a lot of people, it's not just Toyotas or Overlanders, but we see a lot of new people coming into the market that don't have the, the driving experience or the skills to drive safely. And we're seeing a lot more, especially when you get into really rutted uh, hill climbs and descents, which we have on some of our trails, we're seeing a lot of rollovers. And it's from a lack of experience. The, the, the roads aren't that difficult, but they're getting into places they shouldn't be. And they don't have a spotter uh, or a spotter that doesn't know what they're doing. Uh, and they haven't experienced it before, so they get into trouble. And it's not that difficult to roll a vehicle over. Especially when it's got all that weight up above. And then they pack them with everything they own yes. uh, in the bed anyhow. We, uh, we with When we do our adventuring overlanding you might say we we tow with either the jeep or our pickup but we have a trailer an adventure trailer that the rooftop tent sits on that and it's got very very i mean it's set up for for doing difficult trails with everything from the type of hitch it has on it which is the the rock and roll I think it's called. Right. And then we have, um, you know, they're 35, 13, 50, 17 um, with a wide offset and, you know, the suspension and the spring setup and everything. Um, you know, it's basically like a samurai underneath it. And <laughs> nice. it's, it's uh, you know, I can tow. I've, I've towed it over 80 miles an hour testing the trailer with weight and um and i've done rock trails with it and it's uh it's the way to go i mean it's uh i like it because we can park it especially when we're doing like the rebel rally if we are in a base camp where we're going to be for a couple of nights i can just set it up and be be done with it and then we go out come back go out come back go out come back and then you know, it's it's easy enough to break down and set up every day for when we're doing that as well. Yeah, and that's so much better way to go. It's a little costly, but still just such a great way to go. And, and by the time you get a, a good rooftop tent, you're you're spending a fair amount of money. Yes. Um, one of the one of the things I've noticed just in the, in the last few months that I've been looking into this is the, the number of really easy to set up ground tents. Yes. And that's been, um, that to me is kind of a game changer because to go overlanding, you don't really need a big four by four vehicle. Uh, you can use, I, I know there's a, a lot of Subarus and, and smaller uh, SUVs that really probably shouldn't have a rooftop tent on them. <laughs> uh, especially when you put a couple people in there and gear uh, and, you know, you get 300 pounds on the roof of a, a small sedan or SUV. That's probably not the best thing for the vehicle. True. Um, but carrying gear inside uh, or even having a roof rack with some gear is no big deal. Uh, and with the ground tents that are available now, easy to set up and take down. And uh, if you have a cot and a good sleeping bag, that works pretty well. And I know one of the concerns, which I find kind of interesting, is uh, wild animal attacks. That happens, but they're extremely rare. To me, I would rather risk a wild animal attack than a rollover from having a real high center of gravity with a bunch of weight on the roof. Right, especially with a vehicle not designed to be where they're going. 
but they don't know exactly. any better. Yeah. 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 And that's a big part of it. Uh, and that, you know, that leads to the whole education side of things. And that's why we, we do the classes we do. Uh, this Saturday, um, there's an, an overlanding group. Um, there's a big chunk of private property up in Holcomb Valley that used to be owned by the Boy Scouts. Boy Scouts, and they went bankrupt and sold the property. Uh, so now it's a, a an event facility, including camping. So there's this overlanding group that's putting on an event. They're expecting four to 500 vehicles and 1,500 people for this event. Wow. And um, uh, you remember Bill and Wendy Stevens, who, yes. who work with me. Uh, great instructors. We're doing a, a winching and vehicle recovery clinic for a couple of hours on Saturday for this group. Uh, the education process is is extremely important, and we're actually looking at more opportunities to do that kind of education. Uh, for example, the last three or four months, we were supposed to do this last year, but with the pandemic, I got delayed a full year. But we've been doing runs for Redlands Jeep which is located right at the base of our mountains and we're 10 minutes away from a trail from their dealership. We've been doing runs for their customers that are buying new Jeeps. And that's gone extremely well because we have a couple little challenging spots that push the envelope of most people that have never been off-roading or never owned a Jeep. Right. And it really gets their attention. Uh, we even had, and, and Wendy is so great working with people, uh, especially with women. We had one woman who was so afraid she did this little hill climb and it's a real easy hill climb but if you've never done it it's got a little bit of rutting and a fairly gentle slope but you know maybe 15 degrees so it gets your attention if you've never done it she made it up fine but then there's a u-turn at the top and you come back down and wendy was stationed up there and helping spot people up and then she would talk to people to get them come down and either bill or i would be at the bottom to spot them down and this woman asked Wendy to drive the Jeep down for her because she was too afraid to do it. So Wendy kind of talked her through it. And the smile on that woman's face when she got to the bottom was priceless. That's one of the reasons we do this. Uh, and that not only gave her the confidence to do more off-roading in her Jeep, it's going to give her the confidence in her life to do other things that she might be a little afraid to do. Agreed. And, yeah, that's something that that's, that's – to me, that's that's priceless and and uh, worth way more than than whatever money we make doing this stuff. That's one of the reasons I like the Rebel. Oh, that's a great event. It's it's phenomenal. It really is. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty interesting, and and uh, you know, watching people like uh, Nina Barlow uh, do so well, people who have a lot of experience, but the people who have no experience. The stories are great. And I know Charlene Bauer has done that. And uh, I've worked some with Charlene. We've known each other for a few years. And she actually did an event a few months ago in Big Bear. Uh, didn't know the area. So uh, we took her out and showed her some trails that she could do her event on, uh, which went really well. And it was so funny. I had a, a student. And why Jeep is putting 20-inch wheels <laughs> on a Wrangler uh, Sahara with a 4X by hybrid is beyond me. Um, I had a student with one of those and we're making a, a it's a two or three point turn uh, from one trail to another. And I get out to help spot him through there and I hear this whoosh, and it punctured a tire. So we got to pull over to the side. We're going to change the tire. And I noticed this was the right front. The right rear tire was also flat. It's the exact same place, little pinholes. And there were the Bridgestone Duelers. Uh, but we couldn't air down very much because it's on a 20-inch wheel. Right. So we ended up um, – I didn't have my good patch kit with me, uh, which now I do. Uh, transferring from one Jeep to another, it got left behind. Uh, but I had a small patch kit. So we got one tire changed and got the other one patched enough. It was still leaking, but it would hold air long enough. Uh, we'd stop a couple times and got him off the trail. And I knew Charlene was doing a part of her training was, was plugging tires. And it was in the parking lot right down the street from my house. So we got these people off the trail, came over to this overflow parking lot for Snow Summit. Charlene was just finishing doing her tire plugging clinic. So I pulled up and said, hey, do you want to practice in a real flat tire? 
<laughs> so <laughs> she got, awesome. yeah, it was about a, a dozen women. So they all jumped in and plugged both of these tires, uh, the flat that was in the spare position and the one that was still leaking, and had a great time. So it really worked out. So that was, I had a great time with Charlene. So that was really a lot of fun. That's great. So the uh, the overlanding and the training is going to continue, I take yeah. it? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we're probably going to be reach out to more dealers. Uh, we were uh, a, f- a friend of mine works for a Ford dealership in Las Vegas, <clears throat> and uh, we are old racing friends. In fact, it was Rick Titus who'd been up to one of our classes for his radio show, and he asked if we could do do some training like we do for Jeeps or at least lead some runs for Bronco customers. Well, this was before anybody knew about the uh, Bronco off rodeo program. Um, so now that they're doing that, we probably won't end up doing that. But in watching how they're doing the training on those events, some of the videos that I've seen, they're really not showcasing the Bronco, I think, the way it should be, because the Bronco is way more capable than it looks like in some of those videos. Right. Um, it was really just in the last day. Uh, Kevin and, and Brittany Williams posted a light bright video uh, on the Rubicon with Lauren Healy in a modified Bronco on, on uh, 37s. And it did great. Um, I don't think it's going to be quite as comfortable to drive as a Wrangler modified a similar way because of the independent front suspension. But and it was interesting because Lauren was picking lines to try to keep that vehicle as flat as possible. And he's a great driver, so yes. he was going to have no issues with that. Um, but it just, there's going to be a whole new group of people that are getting involved in off-roading, whether it's overlanding or, or crawling or just going out for fun with the Bronco coming on board. Uh, and it's nice to see some competition. So there's a lot of opportunities and, you know, with the, the Chevy ZR2 and the Nissans and the Toyotas, that's a, a, a huge market. Uh, the problem is convincing people that they actually need to be trained. Uh, and that's always been a challenge. And when I was when I was a racing instructor, uh, which I did for a long time, um, people would come to a racing school because it was the only way they were ever going to get to drive a race car. Uh, so you could spend time with them, and they would become better drivers for that reason, even if they never raced. It's a little bit different with off roading. Uh, one of the things about the the Bronco off rodeo, and that's a great program. It's great for people to get that exposure. But I find it curious that they don't let you bring your own vehicle, that you have to use one of the Ford vehicles. Because what I found in my training, it's far better if you're training people in their own vehicle. It also means we don't have to have an inventory of vehicles, which is a, a big plus on our side. Right. But it's so much better if somebody learns in their own vehicle. Uh, and over the years, we've done a, a lot with a couple of Jeep dealers where they would send their new customers to to a class and they pay for it. Um, so it's really nice for the customer, a nice perk. And again, it's one of those things that we have uh, a training area. It's gotten pretty rutted over the years, but there was one hill climb that was actually really easy, about a 20 to 25 degree slope. And it's a typical thing when you start going up, but all you can see is sky and maybe a couple of treetops. And before we would start out, we'd drive out to that training area. And before we'd start up, going around our little training course, which is about a half a mile, people would look at look at that hill and say, we're going to go up that hill? We go, yeah, no big deal. So what we would do is give them a ride in, in one of our vehicles and then ride with them. And boy, by the time they made it up that hill, and they would do it even in a, in a stock sport with mediocre tires. It was no problem to climb this hill. People would get to the top of that hill and the smiles on their faces – like, oh, my God, I had no idea I could do that or that the vehicle could do that. And by the end of the day, they're blown away. And it usually costs them a lot of money because now they're going to start modifying their vehicles. Right. Which leads to another thing. I mean, I've been in, been to Moab enough times and been on the Rubicon enough times. Um, those are the, you know, the major places that, that I wheel um, besides parks out east or in the Midwest is that, People buy the Jeep, per se, and then they they modify it because their friends have modified theirs. 
And then they go out to the parks or go out to these trails and they really, they don't know how to use lockers. They don't know when to use lockers. They automatically just, you know, everything, push all the buttons and and make it work so that when they do get stuck, they have no tools left in the toolbox, you might say. Exactly. And, you know, when I learned to go wheeling, you know, we drove open, open, small tires, manual steering, and it was all about learning to drive the trail by placing the tire in the correct spot, you know, and when I learned to drive it on the trails, it was, you know, 31 inch tires or 30 inch or, you know, the, uh, the old Armstrong true tracks. You know, <laughs> yeah, um, that goes back a ways. Oh yeah. And, um, you know, it was, you didn't have all those tools. You had a winch on the front. So you could, uh, if you did, you know, get in over your head, you could get out, but, I don't see that nowadays. And I see these guys with, and, and women with, um, you know, say the JK or JLs, 37, 40 inch tires, whatever they, whatever they've built their rig up to be, cause it's like their friend has done and they're flipping switches right away. Um, you know, everybody airs down to the same, same pressure, no matter what, you know, what, what the condition calls for, because they don't know any better. And then they get stuck. And, you know, then there's somebody like me with an old beater XJ that pulls up and, you know, has to pull them out or, you know, get them unstuck or spot them through the spot. And, you know, there's just, if I could say anything to anybody that's buying a new vehicle to go out and, and learn to drive it from somebody that has lots of experience, you know, that it's not just because you have the tools doesn't mean you know how to use them. You know, nobody becomes a mechanic by buying, you know, $30,000 worth of tools. That's for sure. <clears throat> you know, just because you have that, your dad had that killer toolbox doesn't mean that you know how to use all the tools in it. <laughs> Correct. <clears throat> yeah, that's very true. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. When we teach a vehicle recovery class, the first thing we teach people or talk about and demonstrate is how not to get stuck. Right. It's far easier to not do a recovery than to do one. And people go through a class like that, you know, nine out of 10 times, they end up helping other people, not helping themselves. And that's good. That's, that's the way it should be. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, you talked about tire placement and boy, like I mentioned earlier, talking about uh, doing tire testing on 33 inch tires when you're used to big tires. That's that's an enlightenment. Everybody should should do that at some point because you now have to think about perfect tire placement. And where a lot of people and a lot of spotters make mistakes is they're only focusing on the front tires, where the rear tires are probably even more important than the front tires. Absolutely. And one of the first things we teach people in, in our basic class is the rear tires track inside the front tires. And how can a uh, JK or JL Unlimited four-door if you make a full lock turn, and we have a video of this, if you make a full lock turn, the rear tires are a full half width of the vehicle inside the front tires. And if you're making a sharp turn in the rocks uh, or through ruts, you can get into a lot of trouble because those rear tires are not going to be where they need to be. So you plan as much for the rear tires, as at least as much as you do for the front tires. Right. Yeah, and, and, and then you come across, you know, like, when we did the Nexon run with you guys, you know, I got to drive. It was the first time I'd driven a JK off road like that. Um, you know, I, I've never, I, I've driven them on the street, but I had never done any rock crawling, you know, any trails or anything like that. Sure. And I'm of that old school. You don't use the weapons until you need them. Don't use the tools until you need them. And, you know, I tried to drive everything first in, just rear wheel drive. And then I would go into four wheel drive and then I would use a rear locker. Then I would use a front locker if I ever needed it. And I don't even think I ever turned a front locker on. Probably not, but it's the way I, I learned, you know, and yeah, and that's the right way. And it, <clears throat> there's times that I've been out in Moab. We wintered out there one time, one year for 90 days. And, you know, especially snow wheeling, 
you know, you if you're if you're starting off using all the tools, you can guarantee that shortly you're going to be having to pull the shovel to get yourself unstuck. And yeah, I don't yeah. like shoveling. That's way too much manual labor. Yeah, and I'm getting way too old for that. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Same with the rooftop tent, climbing up and down that ladder in the middle of the night. Yeah, not good. <laughs> True. We make sure that we have the annex room on ours because you never know who's yeah. going to be outside watching you climb out. You know, That's right. Yep, yep. <laughs> so, so we always make sure the annex room is on so that we get down in, in privacy. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's one of the great things about overlanding. When I did the JK book, um, which was the first Jeep book I did, I'd done an off-roading book before that, but that was the first Jeep-only book. And I was astounded at how much stuff was available in the aftermarket. I mean, I kind of knew that, but until you really start researching it, and realize there is more aftermarket product for a, a Jeep Wrangler than any vehicle in history until you get into overlanding. Oh my God, it's just <laughs> out of control. There's some, look on Amazon and the different things. I mean, from cooking supplies to sleeping bag, everything. It, it's mind boggling. And they even went so far, um, the first two books I did were 144 pages. And because we did the, the Wrangler and the Gladiator and the JL JT book, they added a 16-page signature to that book. Now they've added another 16-page signature on the specs for the overlanding book because there's so much stuff. We could fill four books like that if we wanted to include all of the gear that's available. True. Um, yeah, it's just – it's it's crazy. Um, I'm spending a couple of days uh, next month at Overland Expo in Flagstaff. Uh, Mostly just to see what's new and available and hopefully get a lot of photography. But um, I've been there several times, you know, three or four times in the past, and it's already crazy. It was crazy two years ago. I can't even imagine what it's going to be like after a year absence. Well, you know, we overlanding has turned into, for a lot of people, it's like, and I, I, I've seen this because I travel so much cross country, RV parks or campgrounds they're not necessarily exploring and out in the, in the wilds, but they're in these campgrounds, whether they're national, you know, parks or, or private campgrounds. And they, they set up and it looks like they're the showroom for an overlanding store. And it, and it's, and it, there's a, there's like a code that you have to wear certain shoes you know, you got to have the right hat, the right pants, the right shirt. You know, there's there's all these little things going with it that the guys, the people like myself that have been doing the off-roading, whether it's 4x4 four four or, you know, trails or, or just campgrounding or just camping and getting using your 4x4 four four to get to your favorite fishing spot or camping spot with the family. You know, there's – it's like – why leave the house if you're bringing everything possible? You know. Yeah, and then and then it being a, a, a RV campground. Yeah, where like, uh, where there's people camped ten feet away from you, anyhow. You know, and it's yeah, and there's a lot of them. Yeah, and it's like car shows. You know, where guys hot rod shows, and everybody's parked. You know, in the park. Um, but now you've got all this stuff that you're setting up at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, it it boggles my mind. You know, how many yeah, of those I, people actually get out and, and really use the stuff outside of that kind of environment? Yeah, that's the, the overlanding equivalent of mall crawlers. Yes, there you go. And and yeah, and, and I don't get that. I mean, you know, Jeeps and other 4x4s are cool vehicles. The overlanding gear is cool. But you're missing the point of getting out there when you have that approach and that attitude. And all you have to do is ask Rick Payway about footwear. <laughs> I was, I, I just started when I, when I bought my uh, JL, I just started cracking up because on the passenger side, uh, there's a little plastic piece in the, in the shroud in front of the windshield. And there's a pair of flip flops molded into that, just a little tiny Easter egg. Yeah. Flip flops, and it has to be because of Rick Payway. <laughs> <clears throat> when I worked at, at Peterson Publishing, Rick was was the editor of Four Wheel and Off Road. When I was the editor of Circle Track, so 
Uh, I've known Rick since, oh, I don't know, 25 years, I guess. Um, and he would, when they would do four by four of the year, they would, uh, they used to occasionally, most of the time, they'd come to Big Bear to do rock rock right. on John Bull. And I'd get these kind of odd texts from Rick saying, there's a rumor that uh, there's some four-wheeling going on on John Bull. So he, they weren't supposed to have any of the public come out there. So I knew where they were. So I'd go out and, and hook up with them and hang out. And it was always fun to watch Rick, uh, <laughs> especially on the John Bull Gatekeeper. Uh, he was fearless with the equipment because it was all stock. I remember one year um, the new Cherokee had come out. And I've known Scott Brown, who's the, the West Coast PR guy for FCA or whatever they are now. And he uh, was smart enough to equip. He wouldn't let Rick have a Cherokee unless he could put rock sliders on it, even though they weren't stock. <laughs> and that paid off because they had a, a, a Lexus that got the rockers and fenders bashed in pretty good. But the, the Cherokee came through unscathed. <laughs> So, it was great fun. Rick's a great guy and just really enjoyable to, to hang out with. Absolutely, he is. He, he is fun. One of these days, I'm going to get him get him to to come on and, and do a conversation with him. So, looking oh, forward yeah, to that. Well, that'll be a long, very interesting conversation. Yes, so true. So, yeah, awesome. is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would like to share? Can you think of anything? Oh, there's probably a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah. I think, well, one of the things that, that I got involved in and has been one of the big frustrations, in fact, at the last SEMA show a couple of years ago, uh, I ran into you and Shelly and I mentioned uh, where our adopt trail program, our nonprofit that supports that program was uh, getting, we had had a meeting with the Forest Service and we were supposed to have an MOU for running our nonprofit as a partner with the Forest Service. And I mentioned to, to you and Shelley that uh, I'd do an article on that as soon as we got the MOU and things were up and running. Right. Well, we still don't have it. Wow. Um, I got involved in the adopt the trail program about you know, 10 or 11 years ago. And before that, I was involved in a, there's a nonprofit up here now called the Southern California Mountains Foundation which runs a bunch of different programs, but one of them is their OHV volunteer program, which is an education program. And it's mediocre at best. Uh, they really don't do a lot of education. <clears throat> and they're really only supposed to do it on green sticker trails here in California, which means OHV trails, not street legal four by four trails, because all of their funding comes from the state OHV division, California state OHD, OHV division grants. So you can only really do stuff with on green sticker trails. So uh, when I got involved in Adopt the Trail, great program. At one time, we had 53 clubs, and we were averaging way over 20,000 volunteer man hours a year doing maintenance on the trails in the uh, San Bernardino National Forest. And the program was humming along, and then there were some changes. And um, the guy that created the program and ran it, for 20 some years, uh, ended up retiring. Uh, he was kind of forced to because he did stuff that the Forest Service wasn't happy about, but it got the work done. So the program has been in, in kind of limbo. It still operates, but not very effectively for three years now. And um, I got so frustrated with that. I resigned from the, from the board of the, our nonprofit because the board wasn't doing anything and the Forest Service wasn't doing anything. And now we're on... We've had uh, the previous forest supervisor retired, and we've had two interim forest supervisors, and a week ago, the full-time forest supervisor started. So I'm hoping I get to meet with this person and some of the other Forest Service people and try to, to get this program up and running again uh, the way it used to be. But talk about frustrating. Uh, for an example, we got permission to build a uh, a gatekeeper on the bottom of Gold Mountain with the plan of putting a gate across the trail and it would force people to go up the gatekeeper, which wasn't quite as difficult as other obstacles on the trail. But if you couldn't make it up the gatekeeper, you shouldn't be on the trail. Right. So we 
built the gatekeeper. We had verbal permission to do it. And then we uh, were trying to get the specs for the gate. And the district ranger said, oh, well, you really shouldn't have put the gatekeeper in without written permission. So I know he got in trouble. So now we're stalled putting this gate up. And we did, you know, it's been you know, six months since the gatekeeper, or maybe more since the gatekeeper went so in. So now the entrance has changed because people are going around it. Well, they're using the road. This right, was built okay. adjacent to the road so okay. that fire equipment could get up the road. We did it right next to the road, right at the bottom. Um, so a lot of people are using it, but people can still go up and they're going off trail into a sensitive area, uh, which is why we were doing this in the first place to protect the keep people on the trail and out of the sensitive areas, because that will get that trail closed someday if that keeps up. Right. Fortunately, it hasn't been too bad because of, um, for some reason, people, I think the big problem had been been woodcutters because there's some ironwood up there and woodcutters were going up there and decimating this whole grove of ironwood and they pretty much did that. So now we're not seeing nearly the off route travel that we used to from the woodcutters. But, um, the reason, and this is where it gets just weird, um, we were told the, the reason we can't put the gate up is we can put it up, but we have to have an archaeologist on site for digging the post holes to put uh, the, the gate up. My Lord. And, we, and it's, it's because of the Serrano Indians, Gold Mountain turns out to be a, a, a sacred uh, creation spot for the Serrano Indians. So now we're in the process of contacting the Serrano Indians to see if we can uh, get their support to help protect the land because if they push for it, they'll either make an archaeologist available or waive that for putting in a couple of fence posts. Uh, they can't even do one at their own at their own discovery center without having a post, without having an archaeologist there to make sure there's no artifacts that they're digging up. So, and I know it's frustrating for the Forest Service too, but we get so crippled by that kind of stuff, and we're trying to protect the trail. Not the trail, we're trying to protect all the land around the trail and keep the trail open uh, and sane. And there's so many stumbling blocks that uh, you kind of get tired of beating your head against the wall. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, and, and getting permits. Um, the Forest Service is so overwhelmed with permits for all kinds of stuff that the process is extremely difficult. I would imagine in your district is is especially being so close to to L.A. Yeah, I know um, some friends from uh, Inland Empire Four Wheelers. They put on Forest Fest, which is a great event, and it, they missed last year and this year because of COVID. But in the past. Uh, they would apply, their event is on Father's Day in June. They would apply for a permit, usually in October, maybe September, and even as early as August for that event. And there were day, there were years that they would have to push the Forest Service to issue the permit the day the event started. I guess that's how the government works. It's unfortunate, but it's amazing we get anything done. Yes, it is. It's a shame. And when I was on the board of CORV of the California Off-Road Vehicle Association, and um, when I just before I got on the board, I did a a study for them, uh, and it was kind of a, a strange set of circumstances. I met uh, a guy at a actually at a Fourth of July party at a uh, f friend from our Jeep club, and this guy is a civil engineer. And they have a their association. They give out awards and uh, all kinds of stuff. And you can submit different projects for recognition. And, and talking to this guy, we were talking about off-roading and sustainability. And uh, I said, hey, I've been doing this report for Corva on uh, off-road sustainability in California. And he goes, wow, that would qualify for this. So I actually submitted this to them and made it way farther than I ever thought I would in the process with this group. But what was interesting about doing that report was, and this is uh, eight years ago or so now, before the boom in overlanding and, and uh, UTVs, uh, there are 7 million off-roaders in California, about 20% of the population. And um, the average number of days people would be off-roading was something like seven or eight. So the number of user days is phenomenal. It's right. just 
huge. And you know that's probably close to doubled in the last eight years. So it's maybe from 7 million, it might be 10, 11, 12 million by now. Uh, so it's it's a huge activity. But what was really interesting about this, uh, and going back to overlanders for a second, uh, you talked about that culture. When you ask an overlander, uh, well, you're an off-roader, right? They'll say, oh, no, we're not off-roaders. We're overlanders. They draw a distinction. Well, that's fine if you're in a, an RV campground, but you're an off-roader if you're going on public lands. True. Very true. Just like, you are, just like if you're a nature photographer or a rock climber driving on public lands to access areas you want to uh, recreate in, you're an off-roader. Whether you like it or not, whether you're a Sierra Club member or anything else, you're still an off-roader because you're off-roading. So what was interesting was just that fact that when you look at some of the statistics, like the, the San Bernardino National Forest used to do surveys. They'd hire college kids to survey how people use the forest. And obviously, being at a ski area, was, snow sports was by far the biggest uh, use of the forest. But... They broke it down into street legal off, off-roading uh, or 4 by 4 and OHV, which referred to, at the time, motorcycles and ATVs. And they were about equal at, at just over 10% each. So the total was about 21% of the usage. What they didn't take into account, they only asked the question of your primary reason for using the forest. Well, there's a lot of skiers that are off-roaders, a lot of snowboarders that are off-roaders. They're going to say, well, I'm here for the skiing or snowboarding. There's a lot of people that have that are taking their Subarus out in the forest for a picnic or for nature photography or exploring old mines or whatever. Getting their mountain bikes mm-hmm. out there, whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or hiking or whatever. But they're still using the roads. So if you really look at that, it's probably more like 50 to 60 percent of the people using the forest are going off road and motorized vehicles. So it's way, way bigger than than people realize. And that isn't taken into account. It's not taken into account like the state. um, The state OHV fund comes from green sticker fees, and they have a formula for California gas tax. Uh, Some of that gas tax goes into the OHV funds. But they don't take into account the street legal vehicles. It's only green sticker vehicles. Now, if they took into account green sticker vehicles, we'd have probably four or five times more money in that in that uh, program, which would be a huge help for nonprofits and for for the land managers to actually get work done on the forest and educate people and do road maintenance and all of that. But they won't budge on that. Uh, I've actually gotten in trouble in meetings by even bringing it up. Hmm. The uh, the state people will just no. We're not going to talk about that. It's never going to happen, and that's it. You know, they won't talk about it. Um, so those are some of the the kind of uh, governmental roadblocks that get put up and are unbelievably frustrating. Or you use the the term M O U. Yes, Ex- memorandum of understanding. Okay, and it's the first step into having an actual contract to operate as a partner and it, that could be with anything but with the forest service we have an mou and from that will come an actual uh, agreement partnership agreement which is like a contract to work with the forest service as a participating partner okay which gives it gives the uh, nonprofit a lot more input into how the program is operated hence the reason you haven't gotten one yeah, now it's um, the the last the latest reason we were we actually had the document in hand uh, and it was supposed to be signed about two months ago, and the latest reason is that all the people in Washington that have to do the final approval on the MOU are too busy with some outdoor recreation bill that they can't spend five minutes st- uh, signing a document. Yeah, frustrating. Well, yeah, yeah, it is. Well, Don. I want to say thank you so much for coming on board with Conversations with Big Rich and sharing your rich history in motorsports and off-road. And I'm hoping that people have gleaned a lot of information and will check out your books. Um, I'm looking forward to, to the Overland one. I'd love to uh, 
to see that. And uh, of course, we'll, you know, we'll include it in the magazine as well. But and uh, also the JL and the uh, Gladiator book coming out. Um, looking forward to that as well. Yeah, so am I. And it, it's been awesome speaking with you, Rich. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to, to hook up with you and Shelley. Uh, and I love Four Little Magazine. Thank you. you guys do a great job with that and, and with your one of these days I got to make it out to one of your one of your uh, rock crawling events. Um, well, we're uh, we're still doing them, so you know you'll have time. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, that's great. And uh, we've got to get you back up to Big Bear one of these days and do some fun wheeling. Absolutely, love to. Cool. Uh, well, thank you so much. This has been a, a, a privilege and a great fun. All right. Thank you, Don, and take care. Thank you, all Rich. Right. Bye. 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 If you enjoy these podcasts, please give us a rating, share some feedback with us via Facebook or Instagram, and share our link among your friends who might be like-minded. Well, that brings this episode to an end. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll catch you next week with Conversations with Big Rich. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you very much.